Annalise, uh, so Annalise is our second keynote speaker. Annalise Rouse is a professor of law and anthropology at Cornell University and the founder of Meridian 180, a multilingual forum for transformative leadership. And her most recent book, Financial Citizenship, Experts, Public and the Pol Politics of Central Banking, outlines how a new res relationship between central banks and the public can renew the legi legitimacy of central banks. So thanks for being here, Annalise. Well, thank you so much, uh, Fran, for having me. And thank you also to Stan. And congratulations to Positive Money and to its partners for this launch in, uh, in Brussels. It's really important, uh, in my view, for civil society to be active in this space. And as uh, Stan mentioned, there really aren't very many organizations and that much public attention in this space. Um, I often joke that uh, if I could just get my own mother to care about central banking, I'd feel my life was made, but it's hard. Um, so um, what Positive Money is doing here, I think, is really invaluable. And what I want to talk about very briefly is why, more concretely, why I think it's so invaluable. So just a little bit about me. I'm a lawyer and an anthropologist. And I've studied central banks um, and the interaction between central bankers and the financial markets and the political branches and the public for about 20 years. And so I've had a chance to see up close a really deep problem of democratic legitimacy uh, that is impeding central banks from doing their work um, as they would like and certainly could impede it more at the next financial crisis. And so I've come to believe that the only way to really address this problem is for central bankers to engage with the public and for the public to engage with central bankers much, much more intensively and radically than they do right now. Um, and I realize that's not a positive position, uh, uh, something central bankers love to hear, but I'm just going to uh, put it out there anyway. So, so what is the problem? So here's some examples. So in the run-up to the US election, then candidate Trump um, personally attacked Janet Yellen, saying she should be ashamed of herself for being a rotten, corrupt politician, accused her of being partisan. And when he did that, he was actually ch very cleverly channeling um, political movements on both the right and the left in the United States that had really crystallized around this idea that there's something rotten at the core in the culture of central banking. But of course, Trump was not the first. Before this happened in the United States, it happened in Japan. We had Abenomics that was really uh, about a populist politician coming to power in Japan on a promise, a populist promise, to bring the central bank to heel. Um, and, and of course, closer to home for all of you, we have Brexit. And uh, really, of course, primarily the, the immigration issue was at the forefront. But as you all know, the euro was also very much on the table as one of the targets. And the uh, populist attacks spread not just to the ECB, but also to uh, national central bankers like uh, Governor Carney when they tried to suggest that they had technocratic solutions to deal with the fallout from Brexit. So now, so, the, so clearly we have a problem there. Now, what about on the central banker's side? Well, as many of you know, last week, uh, Deputy Governor Ben Broadbent uh, of the Bank of England declared that the British economy is entering a quote-unquote menopausal phase, something he said meant that it was past its peak in productivity. And um, this patently sexist comment um, really uh, lit up the blogosphere and Twitter. And you saw lots of people who don't normally comment on central banking coming out and really expressing their views quite strongly. And one of the themes that ran through a lot of those comments was like literally the quote, something is rotten at the core in the culture of central banking. So it's not quite obvious, I think, that from both sides, we have a, a quite a massive disconnect and quite a lot of distrust. And, um, and that also that this crisis of legitimacy is partly a problem of a clash of cultures, a clash of the internal culture of central banks, a very expert, closed culture. I'm an anthropologist, and I could say quite, uh, with quite a lot of assuredness that central banks have their own rituals, their own gods, their own chiefs. Uh, so it's its own world, and the world of the public at large. This is not a small matter that we can just ignore, um, because uh, the next financial crisis is coming. All insiders know this at some point. We just don't know where or exactly when or how. 
And at that moment, resolution of that crisis will depend on central banks' legitimacy to act forcefully. And this, in turn, depends on the public's trust in central banks. I think we all know that the second time around, people will be uh, much more hard-pressed to accept the same moves that were made last time. But even beyond this, um, I think that this conversation between the public and central banks also matters for the quality of our democracy itself, given the significance of finance in a globalized financial market. And given its importance to everyone in this room's livelihood, to the relative degree of equality or inequality in, uh, of our life chances, to what state sovereignty means today, and even to outcomes of political processes, such as uh, I think that it's possible uh, to trace part of the cause of uh, the rise of populism in the United States and Trump to dissatisfaction with what happened in 2008. So given all of this, um, it seems to me that public participation in financial governance, and what I'm gonna call financial citizenship, is absolutely critical, not just to a healthy economy, but to a healthy democracy. Now, the gap between the public and the central banks is nothing new. It's been around for a long, long time, but it long was managed um, with one, let's say, foundational theory or myth. Um, and here's what it was. The idea was there's a realm for politics. There's a place for the public to take a lead. That would be um, things like taxation, right? But there's another sphere of activity, of political activity that is purely technocratic. It's scientific, and that's where the experts should take the lead and the public should stay out. So it's a bit, the idea is that central banking is a bit like building a bridge. The public doesn't care about how it gets built, and frankly, they shouldn't care. We don't want to build a bridge by committee or by popular vote. Um, so uh, a, a easy marker for this is the Alicina and Summers uh, paper from 1993 that basically makes the case for the fact that central banks acting alone produce better outcomes for all of us. Now, this paper has since been, I think, quite roundly criticized, but my point here is not to engage with the economics of, or the, pol the political science of the argument, but rather to point out that in, in the minds of the public at large, the theory that se what central banks do is purely technocratic and scientific and therefore the public should stay out, that theory has ceased, has ceased to convince people. Now, why has it ceased to convince people? Well, there are multiple reasons. One is that the tools aren't working as they should. Um, Another is the effect of 2008, where the public saw the central bankers, the supposedly independent cloistered central bankers, working hand in hand with politicians, as they should in a moment of crisis, right? But they saw them working together and therefore realized that they were not so independent from the political process in the first place. And also they saw that the effects of those policies were unequal, that there were inequalities that, that resulted not just nationally but transnationally in terms of swap lines being offered to some countries and not to other countries. And so that central banks seem to be picking winners and losers. And of course, central bankers don't help themselves when they make gaffes like uh, Mr. Broadbent's uh, because that's when uh, they themselves make very plain that central bankers are not machines that they are culturally conditioned human beings. Um, and so the argument from the public then becomes, if central banking is value-laden, if it is culture-bound, if it has effects that are usually in the realm of politics, such as distributive effects, then the public has a right to have a voice. Now, one, what should we do about this? Well, one suggestion, I think it's a really important one, is to bring central banking more under the umbrella of the political process. And it's clearly critical to do this, and Positive Money has a campaign in place uh, to encourage greater oversight and, uh, by the European Parliament of the ECB, and that seems really important. But I want to suggest that political legitimacy is also a matter of culture and not just of formal political levers of oversight. So let me just give you some examples from Europe. So um, there's been some really interesting sociology done, not by me, but by another scholar, on uh, the difference in perceptions of central bankers themselves within the ECB versus the Deutsche Bank. 
So in theory, the ECB, of course, should have more autonomy and feel more free to act because of its uh, larger legal protections, which are enshrined in a treaty, of course, right, and not in national law. But in practice, it's the other way around, that central bankers at the Deutsche Bank seem to feel much more free to act. And why is this? And the sociologist who did this work has argued that central bankers um, uh, in, de in Germany benefit from a post-war public commitment to the Deutschmark as very significant in German national identity as post-war nation. And therefore, there's a, a trust in the Deutsche Bank that is very different than the lack of trust the ECB enjoys because it simply doesn't have that kind of cultural basis for itself. Um, likewise, um, some wonderful researchers at the Copenhagen Business School have done some work on the, um, on the uh, Danish Central Bank governors. Very, very clever uh, work over, I think, two governorships to craft a, a, a very local in legitimacy narrative for the Danish Central Bank, arguing that uh, these central bankers understood that certain things matter to the Danish people, in particular, the idea of uh, national solidarity. And so they pitched the reason for the existence of the central bank in terms that keyed themselves to that debate about national solidarity. And these uh, scholars at the Copenhagen Business School argue that, as a result, the uh, Bain Danish central bank enjoys an enviable degree of, um, of, uh, of legitimacy and even like downright love from the people of Denmark that many of us would, uh, many central bankers would love to, to have on their side. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that engaging with the public in a in really a two-way dialogue, not the typical uh, you know investor education that is really quite pedagogical and you know, but a real dialogue needs to be a core part of the mission of every central bank, not an aftermath. Um, and um, this is really crucial because the new legitimacy story that is going to carry central bankers through the next crisis and enable them to act when they need to act is not going to be a version of the old one, the just trust us, we're the experts we know. It's going to be, or it's not even going to be just trust us because we have delegated authority and so we have a right to know, to act. It's going to be something like, of course we should be trusted because we have expertise, we know things, but also because we listen and we engage, and um, in a in, we engage in a way that's culturally meaningful, not just putting out minutes that um, are very you know in in large volume and difficult for anyone to engage with, and that we have in place internal mechanisms of self evaluation and critical reflection on what we're hearing from the public, so that we actually put it into some kind of practice. And if this sounds um, really far-fetched and impossible to the central bankers in the room, I would say that um, you already engage very actively with members of the financial community all the time, uh, formally and informally, and, um, and that if it's possible to do this uh, with the financial community, it's possible to do it also with civil society. Uh, just by way of example, I go to lots and lots of conferences with central bankers, and I usually see central bankers some representatives of other branches of government and some academics, but I rarely see NGOs, and I have, don't think I've ever seen members of the public at large just sort of invited to come. So, so, um, so how would we have this conversation? Well, I think there's a few elements that seem really critical. First, central bankers need to meet their critics halfway and acknowledge to the public what they acknowledge in private all the time and what, what all sophisticated insiders understand full well. And that is that number one, there are profound distributive consequences to what regulators do, to what central bankers do. And that while expertise is real and absolutely necessary, it does entail value judgments. And central bankers are operating in a world of considerable unknowns. And there's nothing to do about this. It can't ma be made, we can't wish it away. It's just the way it is. And so then the conversation with the public should be around not what's in the videos on most central bank websites, which is, let's tell you how we're keeping you safe. Thought you'd like to know. But rather, how should the difficult trade-offs between distributive consequences, say, of interest rate policies or financial stability policies be handled? 
How would you think that we should make these difficult decisions? That's one thing. The second thing I would say is it's absolutely imperative to dis diversify the staff of central banks themselves. I would venture to guess that if the Bank of England were, uh, had achieved gender parity, they would not find themselves in the firestorm they find themselves in this week. Um, but beyond that, um, uh, the, uh, you know, it is simply a fact that having greater geographical diversity, greater religious diversity, greater class diversity, greater diversity of institutions that people have graduated from is going to produce better central bank policy because there will be less groupthink and there will be more access to different sectors of the economy and different, world, different views on the markets. Um, a third thing I would suggest is to diversify the toolkit within central banks themselves. Um, there still is quite little uh, in, uh, work being done in, I mean some, but quite little still work being done on uh, uh, alternative economic theories and even less sociological or anthropological research, a little bit of history, very little political science. So there's really room for thinking about central banks in a much broader way on the inside and thinking about policy that way. That's gonna help central banks to communicate better and it's gonna help them to craft that legitimacy narrative to the way that those uh, governors in Denmark just did because they were apparently uh, very clever geniuses on their own. But I'll conclude by saying that the public also has a tremendous responsibility here. Um, and um, if this is gonna be a two-way dialogue, it's a two-way responsibility. We all understand that citizenship is a duty, not a right alone, and the same is true of financial citizenship. And so it seems to me that if we're going to, ha if the public is to step up and serve its, so to, to fulfill its side of the bargain, then there is an absolutely critical role for organizations like this one also for universities like mine, and also for, um, for the financial media in creating a platform in which a sophisticated and yet broad conversation can take place. So I'm just really um, delighted to be here to celebrate this launch, um, wishing Positive Money um, all the greatest success in the months and uh, years ahead. And I really look forward to uh, watching as you facilitate a new partnership between central banks and the larger public um, as we go forward. Thank you. Just going to take chair's privilege and ask Anneliese uh, one question, and then I'm going to ask the panel to come and join me up here. Um, so I guess my question is around whether, you know, you engage with central bankers every day, every week. Is there a sense of like denial a little bit in terms of like whether they should be held directly to account by the public and whether they should even consider like having to kind of think about their demographics and their um, diversity? Yeah, great question. So um, I think most central bankers that I know feel... Uh, feel tremendously, um, they feel that they're not on solid terrain, that they understand very well that their legitimacy is under attack, and they're concerned about what to do with the next crisis. That said, the idea of actually going out there and engaging with the public strikes them as pure insanity, I would say. So, um, so the view is people can't understand, they don't want to talk to us anyway, that would be position number one. If you say, well, no, there are people who'd like to talk to you, position number two is, oh, well, we don't have legitimate political authority to speak to them. They should speak to their legislature, and their legislature should come and speak to us, to which I say, well, you're already talking to the banks, so how do you have authority to talk to them and not to the, not to, to the public at large? Um, but I think there's just really a difference of cultures here and a kind of a a distrust and maybe even a certain degree of distaste. So it's going to take a lot of work for you guys to get these people together, but you're the ones to do it. So. Thank you so much. And if I can ask... Um...